Hey, Walter Sorrells back with another Knife Makers Friday Five. Today, knife making myths busted. All right, we're gonna take on a bunch of knife making myths today. Let's jump right into it with myth number one. Knife makers spend most of their time banging steel. So if you watch, uh, you know, it could be anything from YouTube videos to forged in fire, you'll see lots and lots of video of people standing next to an anvil beaten on red hot steel. In fact, that is not what most bladesmiths spend most of their time doing. So the knife making world can kind of be divided into two groups. Hammer bangers, the guys who beat on red hot steel, and stock removal guys who use belt grinders to grind a knife out of a big bar of steel. Now, the truth is, actually, even the hammer banging guys spend much more time on the belt grinder than they do hammering out that steel. Most of your time as a knife maker is spent sanding things, whether it's doing it by hand or whether it's using a belt grinder that's the reality of knife making, abrasives. You know, if I look around my shop here, I have so many abrasive products, it's not even funny. I got sandpaper over there, I've got uh, belt grinders in there, buffer, abrasive blaster, abrasive chop saw. I mean, I could just go on and on all day long. Uh, whereas, I got one anvil and uh, one forge, and I probably spend 5% of my time beaten on steel, all the rest of the time is shaping everything and most of that work's done with abrasives. All right, myth number two, Damascus steel is the best steel there is. Uh, no. Damascus steel is beautiful. It's just that simple. It looks really cool. Now, there's a lot of complexity to this because there are a zillion different kinds of steel and even different kinds of Damascus steel have different kinds of characteristics, different components. But the fact is that Damascus steel is just any old normal kind of steel stacked up and forge welded together. And so Damascus steel simply has the characteristics of those original constituent steels, whatever they might be. Now look, there are a lot of little complexities about the microstructure of Damascus steel and so forth, but at the end of the day, it's just steel. Now, I don't wanna beat this one to death, but heat treating is the most important part of uh, any steel. So, um, you know, to just say some blanket statement like Damascus steel is superior to other steel, no, sorry, busted. All right, following up on that subject, uh, this is kind of a generic myth, but there's always some kind of steel, S16R32 9 million V, whatever it is, is the best steel in the world. If you poke around on the internet, you're gonna find a million different ideas about what the best steel is, and everybody thinks that it's a different thing. They're all wrong. There is no best steel. I could go on about this all day, but uh, a couple points on this. First, you know, it really depends on what you're trying to do with the knife. So the most important thing to understand about steel is that what's made it mankind's most important material is that it can really take on a lot of different qualities. You can make it super hard, you can make it uh, super strong, you can make it uh, so that it resists abrasion or, um, shearing or cutting, you can make it so that it'll bend, you can make it so that it won't bend, you can make it so that it resists oxidization, you can make it so it doesn't. Uh, you can, I mean, they're just endless, endless qualities that you can kind of optimize for, and there are a lot of ways that you have to go about doing that. First is what you add to the steel um, in terms of alloying elements, uh, starting with iron and carbon, which are, you know, the basis of steel, but there are all these other things, manganese, tungsten, uh, silicon, nickel, chromium, and each one of these adds its own little characteristics. Beyond that, there's another really important thing that a lot of people don't know too much about, which is heat treating. 
every steel changes its characteristics depending on how hot it is and how that the, the heat is cycled in the steel. We're all pretty familiar with the idea that you can take a Japanese sword or whatever and plunge it into a big trough full of water and now the steel is harder. But, you know, there are a whole lot of nuances to all of these different ways of thermal cycling steel and they all result in different kinds of qualities. And if you're trying to make the best sword, you want very different qualities than if you're trying to make the best camp knife or the best whatever it might be. So at the end of the day, there really is no best steel. There's the best steel for your particular application, maybe, but even there, it really depends on what the Smith is gonna do with it. Myth number four, Damascus is not Damascus. So I did a, a video about this a long time ago called Will the Real Damascus Stand Up? It's probably not so true today, but it used to be that all these little trolls would get on the internet, and if you ever said the word Damascus, they would say, this is not Damascus that you're making, you what you mean. Well, the, the basic idea comes from this. If you go back in history, you know, about a thousand years, uh, there was a kind of steel that was produced in India and also in Central Asia, what's now Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, uh, and you know, a few other places, um, which was basically crucible steel. Steel was made in a little clay pot, it was heated up super hot till it melted, and uh, it produced a, a very nice form of steel that uh, when you forged it out and etched it would have a, a pattern in it. Um, this is typically called Woot steel, um, but sometimes people refer to it as Damask or Damascus or whatever. Anyway, to me this argument is really kind of boring. People have been referring to forge welded or pattern welded steel, which is where you stack up a whole bunch of little sheets of steel and weld them together in the forge and then you can manipulate those patterns. Uh, this is what's been called Damascus steel in Europe for you know, at least 200 years. It was called that in the gun making trade. It's been used in knives for a very long time and people have called, called it Damascus. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, not an interesting debate at all. And so the myth that this is Damascus and that is pattern welded steel and never the twain shall meet, busted. So myth number five is one that I can testify to myself. Um, and that myth is that bladesmiths are just making money hand over fist. You know, it's natural if you go down to Walmart and you see that a, a knife costs $13 and then you go to the blade show and you see something that looks kind of similar to that and then somebody's charging $700 for it, you say, well, what's the delta there? Th that must be profit. But of course that's not true. Um, if you're, making, uh, if you're making knives by hand uh, and you're polishing everything by hand, which is you know, the way custom makers typically do it, whoever buys that knife has to pay for the labor of all this painstaking work that distinguishes a custom made knife from something down at Walmart. So. Which brings me around to another myth, the key to making good knives is to have all this fancy schmancy gear. Uh, that professional knife makers presumably own. Yeah, most of this stuff that's sitting around my shop here is pretty handy. I've got a couple belt grinders over there. I've got a heat treating furnace here, metal cutting band saw, I've got a CNC machine back there. All that stuff costs money and all of it helps make better knives. But the truth is they were making beautiful, beautiful cutting tools in Toledo and Sheffield and uh, in Japan and in India a thousand years ago. And uh, it was all made by hand, no machines involved, um, and they made beautiful, beautiful stuff. So I guess the point I should add there is if you're interested in trying to make knives, you really don't have to start with a whole bunch of the fancy schmancy stuff that you see on YouTube. So the next myth, uh, forged in fire is fair, and whoever wins forged in fire is the greatest smith there ever was. Or the opposite myth, forged in fire is completely unfair, it's a racket, it's, uh, it's rigged, it's a joke, it's a ripoff, whatever. Neither one is the case. The fact is, forged in fire is a contest, much like a baseball game. The thing you have to understand about forged in fire is that 
the conditions that you're operating in in the contest are completely unlike what you would be doing in your own shop. It's at a different pace and uh, under time constraints that no normal knife maker would ever, uh, you know, use. And so, you know, the results are sometimes a little screwy. So I have my own little perspective on this based on my own experience. Uh, when I went into Forged and Fire, I probably had five times as many hours of experience as all three of my competitors combined, and I still lost. Uh, maybe that just says I'm a crappy knife maker, but I don't think so. You know, what it amounts to is that uh, the conditions that you run into each week, the conditions of that particular competition, um, you just never know what you're gonna get. You might be um, getting some kind of piece of steel that you just can't harden, or you may run into some particular skill that you know, you've just never practiced before. It could be a million things. Um, I can tell you, you know, it's not fixed. Uh, you know, the rules are consistently applied. In fact, they're really quite scrupulous about, you know, making sure that nobody's cheating, that nobody's getting on the phone and calling somebody of theirs and saying, hey, how do I, you know, none of that. They're, they're, it's a very controlled environment and they really work very hard to make sure that everybody plays by the same rules. However, there is a difference and, you know, this was kind of my experience. Uh, if you if you play baseball, everybody uses the same baseball. So you know if you rolled up at the baseball park and they said, all right, we're going to draw balls out of a hat, and this team gets a baseball, and this other team gets a softball or a nerf ball or something, uh, the results are going to be really different because the challenges that they're going to face uh, are not the same. Um, it's hard to hit a home run if the other team's pitching nerf balls to you. Um, and that was kind of the experience that I had, you know, it was one of these iron in the hat type things where everybody had to draw uh, a different challenge. And my challenge, honestly, you know, was harder than the other guys that I was competing against. I'm not complaining about it, that's just the nature of the contest. All right, myth number eight, there's a perfect knife out there. This is kind of the myth of Excalibur. You know, everybody who's into knives, especially, you know, as collectors, um, you know, kind of has this idea that they're always chasing the perfect knife. Uh, and I get that, but the truth is there is no perfect knife. Um, it's an idea that we have that helps us stay interested and um, hone our skills and try to get better and try to find more interesting knives and, you know, more beautiful swords or whatever it might be. Um, but, I, you know, maybe it's because I come from the, the perspective of, I mean, I was a martial arts guy before I started making Japanese style swords, which is kind of my specialty. And um, so I always, you know, I always tell people, look, a knife is a screwdriver. Even a Japanese sword or, you know, a hand and a half sword made out of Damascus steel or whatever, they're all tools. So at a certain point, it has a, a functional quality and that functional quality is never perfect. You know, you're always giving something up to get something else. If you want better edge holding, it's probably gonna be a little more brittle. Uh, if you want more shock resistant, it's probably gonna be, you know, have less, uh, less edge holding. Um, you know, and, and, and so it goes across the spectrum. If you don't want it to rust, um, you lose some other qualities. And that's just the nature of it. So I personally am a little skeptical of the whole Excalibur approach to knife making, but I get it. You know, everybody wants the best thing. Okay, final myth, and this is the one that irritates me no end. Uh, titanium, the world's greatest metal. No, it's not. Um, there's this myth about titanium. People think that, oh, if I just made a sword or a you know, knife or whatever, whatever out of titanium, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? No, it would not. Titanium is uh, valuable in the following way. Titanium has the highest strength to weight ratio of any metal. That's super cool if you wanna make an airplane, but has no value for sword making uh, or knife making. The only thing that titanium is really useful for, I mean, maybe there are a few little exceptions, but it's not good for blades. 
Titanium is great for folder handles, liner locks, things like that. But for the actual blade itself, no, titanium's garbage. It's a little bit harder than bronze that was used you know, back when they were making the pyramids. It's actually kind of in the same general realm as the steel that you would use for I-beams or something like that. Um, it's just not that hard. So uh, if you made a knife out of it, the knife would get dull very rapidly and that's not a good thing. So titanium, nope, busted. All right, that about wraps it up. So uh, just a couple notes. Uh, Coming up, we are gonna have um, probably two or three weeks from now, the POPs project of the month. Not sure what that's gonna be. Last month, I did the Lion Killer Knife, which was really a fun project. If you hadn't seen that one yet, go check it out. Uh, also, uh, I have recently gotten a uh, little uh, CNC laser type thing, a laser cutter. Um, Pretty cool little tool, always wanted to have one of these and uh, we're gonna find out how useful it is for knife making, that's gonna be fun. I'm hopefully gonna have that ready next week. Also, I'm finishing up a uh, Feather Damascus chef's knife and uh, a couple weeks, hopefully we'll have a video about the making of that knife. All right guys, thanks for watching and keep on making those knives. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years, so I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com